afternoon. Wow, that works. Can everybody hear me? Sorry about the temperature. Anyway, welcome to our outdoor living room. Uh, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started. So for those of you who, whom I don't already know, I'm Steve Slick, and on behalf of the Intelligence Studies Project, I'm at Center for National Security and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Let me welcome you to our guest lecture this evening on Israeli intelligence, balancing conservatism and innovation. Excuse me. Thanks. Yeah. This evening's event is the first in a planned series of talks we're going to host on the intelligence organizations of other states, both American allies and adversaries. It's probably safe to claim that every organized state in the world has at least one institution or agency that's responsible for gathering, evaluating, and presenting information to political leaders who have hard decisions to make. Right? Beyond that, though, there's tremendous variation in how states actually organize their intelligence communities, and moreover, the distinctive cultures that grow up around different intelligence and security communities. So understanding these commonalities and differences is increasingly important as intelligence work is often central to strategies for competition short of the war. So it's fitting that we open our series with Israel. Israel is America's closest ally in the Middle East, and an acknowledged power in the intelligence field. Indeed, we might talk a little bit later about the uh, image that the state of Israel has built and burnishes around its intelligence prowess, and how that reputation serves Israel's national interests. So before I introduce our guests, let me just remind you all of the format and ground rules this evening. Our guest will deliver remarks based on his research and direct experience with Israel's intelligence culture. I'll then uh, join him on stage and we'll leave a, a short discussion after which we'll open the floor to your questions. So when that time comes, please wait until you're called on. Uh, we'll dispatch a microphone so everybody can uh, hear your question. And you should please make sure that your question concerns intelligence and Israeli intelligence rather than Israeli policies or current events. There'll be other opportunities where we can talk about those issues. So we're extremely uh, proud and fortunate this evening um, to welcome a respected practitioner and scholar of intelligence, Itai Shapiro, retired as a colonel with Israeli Defense Intelligence, where he served as an intelligence analyst at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. He was the deputy head of IDI's research and analysis division, where he supervised the organization's analytic products, tradecraft, and methodologies. He also served as the head of the IDI's red team department that generated alternative analysis and stimulated disruptive, disruptive thinking throughout the organization. So Colonel Shapira is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. So please join me in welcoming the Tashi Bureau to the University of Texas. Um, first of all, it's really an honor for me uh, to be here, and I'm very excited um, to be really in this uh, very unique uh, venture. Um, I already feel here at Austin, at home, not just because of this hot and humid weather, <laughs> but because of the mindset and the friendship and hospitality. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that. And I've been told that in the University of Texas in Austin, there's a saying that what happens here changes the world. So I'm not sure if we will change the world in this uh, one and a half hours, but I do want to offer uh, a bit of my perspective using cultural lens to think about intelligence organization, about intelligence breakup, and about three aspects of intelligence which I'll go through a few times uh, this afternoon, uh, borrowing some frameworks from Sherman Kent, the founding father of American intelligence. I'll speak about intelligence as a product, as a process, and then as an organization, but I'll also discuss intelligence culture. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to start this. I'll speak for about 30 minutes, more or less. Later when I'll discuss Israeli culture, you'll see that more or less is a very, very Israeli term. More or less, more or less. Um, so my talk reflects my 25 or 26 years of experience 
in these are the defense intelligence and the experience I've gained in my scholarly research. These are all in my personal view. I do not represent the Israeli government and the Israeli defense forces uh, whatsoever. And the academic research I've been doing is really uh, about the Israeli national intelligence culture. I have about 26 years of doing practice in Israeli intelligence. Why not try to do it a little bit from a theoretical, uh, theoretical perspective? So today I will introduce you very shortly to this concept of national intelligence cultures, a concept which has its roots in strategic, in political, and in organizational cultures. And the main motivation for my research, which will lead me to the core of our discussion, is which is how is Israeli intelligence, how is Israeli intelligence conservative and traditional on the one hand, but very innovative on the other hand, in Israel these two can't go with this. Um, my motivation is that there are many studies about national intelligence cultures, but naturally, mainly about American and British. A little bit about the French, a little bit about the Russian, a little bit about the Chinese, but there are not studies about Israeli intelligence culture. There is a tremendous, really an abundance of articles and studies about Israeli intelligence by amazing scholars. Some of them I'll try to uh, cite here, but there is not a study that uses the culture lens to look at Israeli intelligence. So I'm trying to, to, bridge, uh, to bridge these two. Uh, uh, two caveats are probably in place. National intelligence culture and even more broad, the culture analysis is a too broad term. Uh, there is a risk of overgeneralization, of oversimplification, of the PIO in words, uh, but they are in place. So I will try to limit this. I will mainly speak about intelligence in terms of knowledge and less of intelligence in terms of special operations, but we will get to, the, to discuss issues of special operations. And the other thing I want to mention, a a study of national intelligence culture has to be imperative. This is why it's really exciting and an honor for me to be the first thing here in a series. Because in order to understand national intelligence cultures, you need to compare between national intelligence cultures. This, I hope, after our talk today, you might learn a little bit about Israeli national intelligence culture, but maybe even use this to reflect a little bit about American uh, intelligence culture. So today I will discuss, I don't know if this is the same case in the US military, in the Israeli military, Israeli officers divide everything in the world into three. Everything, whether it's time for lunch or an operational design. So I plan to prove that this stereotype is correct and I will speak today about three main issues. I'll discuss Israeli, I'll give a short background, background about Israeli intelligence. Then I'll discuss Israeli national intelligence culture and the balance between conservatism and innovation, and then I'll try to speak a little bit about what are the implications of this unique, uh, uh, unique culture. So just a short background about Israel intelligence, again, without getting into too much details. There are three main organizations in the Israeli uh, intelligence community. The first, who I grew up, uh, is Israeli Defense Intelligence. This is the military director of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. It sounds confusing, and it is. This is hardly a your standard military intelligence organization. This is the military organization of the IDF, but also of the Minister of Defense, but also reports to the Prime Minister. This is Israel. This is an intelligence organization that oversees collection, analysis, counterintelligence, and special covert operations, all in the same organization. And although it is a general staff directorate, so you might think it probably deals only with strategic issues, it has capacities and capabilities and organizations that deal with, deal with the most technical and tactical issues. So this is Israeli Defense Intelligence. I refer to it today as the IDI. The IDI prides itself on a concept that's very, uh, I grew up on that concept, which is called holistic intelligence. It's very interesting if you look at uh, some of the writings of Yoshafat al-Kabi. Yoshafat al-Kabi was the chief of the IDI in the late 1950s. The late 1950s. He spoke about holistic intelligence. If you read a book about a retired one-star general from the IDF called Itai Brun, the same uh, first name as mine, uh, he speaks about, just for four or five years ago, he speaks about holistic intelligence. The IDI prides itself on the ability to provide a holistic intelligence game all levels of warfare and statecraft, tactical, operational, strategic, and national, and on all issues. The IDI's research and analysis division, where I served for many years, really conducts all these all these, uh, all these issues, uh, focusing naturally on threats, but also on opportunities. 
The IBI, as every organization, has two major trumps. The first one is, of course, the Yom Kippur War of 1973. I'll speak many, many times today about the Yom Kippur War, which is interesting because uh, 50 years have almost passed. And still, this trauma is very, very dominant, very, very vivid. Uh, the trauma, of course, is the failure of intelligence analysis, but the more I get to learn about this issue, the more I found amazing facets, much beyond the issue of how come did the uh, analysts not understand or not connect the dots. There are issues of collection and raw information and intelligence and policy relationship. It's amazing, Uri Bar Yosef is a great uh, Israeli scholar who studied this war from each and every aspect, but also many other scholars. And the second trauma the IDI is facing, this is the younger generation. Uh, I'm, I would say, in between these generations, uh, without revealing my age, 46. Um, the second trauma is the second Lebanon war in 2006, a war between Israel and Hezbollah, uh, the terrorist organization practically ruling Lebanon. The trauma there was mostly that operational and tactical intelligence was not, was created but was not disseminated to the field unit, and therefore did not influence. It's a totally different trauma. The young officers have grown up on this trauma. Both of these traumas have caused the IDI to change its processes, uh, organization, and products. I'll get to that in a minute. And one last aspect, although the IDI is a military organization, there are many civilian aspects to it. You know that Israel is considered a startup nation. Most Israeli CEOs of cyber, AI, and machine learning companies come from Unit 8200, which is the Israeli CB and cyber unit and all other issues. And it's a really unique organization. The second major organization inside the, uh, uh, inside the Israeli intelligence is uh, Mossad. The full name in Hebrew is the Mossad of the of Kedim Yuchadim, for those of you who know Hebrew. The name implies many things. It's the Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations. This is an organization that is subordinate directly to the Prime Minister, directly to the Prime Minister. Conducts collection, conducts analysis, but mostly conducts special, covert, and clandestine operations mainly to counter WMD, uh, I, I apologize for using too many you know, military acronyms, weapons of mass destruction, uh, projects of adversaries, and to counter terrorism. A very unique organization uh, which um, is really trying to bridge how to become a collection analysis organization but also maintain its operational capabilities. This organization, by the way, was also influenced by the Yom Kippur War. One of the reasons for Mossad having a amazing, an amazing analytical capability is the lessons of the Yom Kippur War. I'll talk about that in a minute. Mossad is an organization that has a great tension. It is turning very much to the issues of technology, cyber, AI, machine learning, but it still has its tradition. The tradition of Mossad, special operations, and human, human intelligence, spy, espionage. And the third organization in Hebrew is called the Shabak, Shehud al Akhali, General Security Service, sometimes called Israeli Security Agency, sometimes called Shin Bet. Uh, there are many names. This is probably the domestic uh, organization. Uh, this organization, again, has collection analysis capabilities, but it is mostly in charge of counterintelligence, counterinsurgency, and counterespionage inside Israel. Therefore, this organization, and by the way, if you're trying to make comparisons to the CIA or the FBI or to the NSA, it's rather hard to compare because in Israel, in Israel everything is a bit uh, complicated or chaotic, whatever you call it. But this organization, Shabak, engages Israeli civilians, Israeli citizens. Uh, again, an intelligence organization with collection and analysis capabilities, but it has to maintain operational capabilities, and again an organization that is turning to the field in its website, you can see how it's trying to recruit people from the technology and AI and cyber fields, but still has to maintain traditional human intelligence and special operations capabilities. There's another small organization in the Israel intelligence community. This is the Research Center of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A rather small organization, not considered formally a part of the Israel intelligence community, maybe conducting political uh, and economic uh, analysis, a rather small organization. Now, one, one interesting thing I want to mention. Formally, or the Ure, what we would call, there is no Israeli intelligence community as a community. 
In Israel, there is no director of national intelligence. There is no national intelligence strategy. There are no, for example, when the US is called intelligence community directives, national guidances. There are no such cases in Israel. There is no law by which the intelligence community operates as a community. The heads of the organizations sometimes meet in a form called Varash. Varash, it's an everything you know, acronyms, but in Hebrew it's an acronym of the committee of the heads of services. So the heads of services, IDI and Mossad and Shabbat meet, but not to discuss the national strategy. They usually coordinate special operations. But, and with this I would enter the issue of Israeli intelligence culture. De facto, there definitely is an Israeli intelligence community. The organizations are aligned, are coordinated. They have many, many joint projects, by the way. Most of the joint projects between organizations are initiated from the young and junior officers. And this difference between the euro, formal, by law, and the facto, what's really happening is very visible. And with that, I would like to, to discuss really a few facets of, of Israeli national intelligence culture. Again, we have to remember, when I say national intelligence culture, there are many subcultures. But I'll try to be uh, a bit uh, broad. And some of these are unique, some of these might sound to you a bit different than the American intelligence culture definitely than the British, naturally. Different nations have different cultures. First of all, in Israel, the common wisdom is that intelligence should be integrated into policy, strategy, and operations. Intelligence should influence through integration in policy, strategy, and operations. Israelis have an aversion for what we sometimes call, I'll say in English, not in Hebrew, ivory towers, or academic intelligence, or intelligence just for the sake of knowledge. The Israeli culture is integration of intelligence inside uh, policy. Israelis, by the way, like the Americans, have a fear of biases and of politicization. But in Israeli intelligence culture, the tool to deal with these issues is usually neutrality and critical thinking, and not objectivity and not distance from policy. Uh, so this is one aspect of the Israeli mentality or culture. The other issue is a very dramatic inclination towards practice and towards operation and towards action. Very low tolerance for theory, for history, for education. Now this might sound weird. Because the Israeli intelligence has done many things, can learn a lot about itself, and can definitely learn a lot from studying national intelligence or other intelligence agencies. But by the way, many times when Israelis say philosophical or theoretical, they mean in practice. And uh, in Israel, for example, there is no national intelligence university. In Israel, as weird as it may sound, there are no academic intelligence studies program. In Israel. Uh, there's a really a version for education. Most of the training is done on the job training. Most of the training I've conducted in my 26 years was on the job training. And uh, this is a, a, an interesting issue. In, in the last years, some of this is beginning to change. And Israeli practitioners, including high-ranking generals, are beginning to write. Not just write memoirs, but are really beginning to write professional and theoretical articles. Uh, so this is beginning to change. Uh, in the Israeli intelligence community, there's usually a preference for independent initiatives, for improvisation, for informality. There's an aversion towards formal doctrine, formal guidance. Again, I think this is also very characteristic of Israeli mentality and, and culture uh, as a whole. I mentioned, for example, there are no intelligence community directives in Israel. There are no formal public intelligence products. Formal. Think about, for example, the U.S. intelligence community, about the NIEs, National Intelligence Estimates, or ICAs, Intelligence Community Assistance. There are no such products in Israel. And two last issues I want to mention. Uh, why not discuss a little bit of Jewish religion or Jewish tradition? Israelis very much prefer oral traditions, or traditions being transferred from generation to generation orally, and not through written documents. In Jewish tradition, by the way, this one of these concepts is called Tushva. Tushva is Torah Shebaal Peh, oral Torah, Torah, one of the books of the Bible. 
This is very vivid, very strong in Israeli mentality. If you want to try and search for these, if you think there are thousands of papers which document what is the Israeli intelligence doctrine, you would not find it. But from generation to generation, I was passed this tradition, I tried to pass it to my uh, uh, officers. This tradition is being, uh, is being passed. And then a last aspect I want to discuss is the issue of the dominance of the Yom Kippur failure. Again, almost 50 years ago. Uh, this is not a trauma only for intelligence, but also for the military, also for the uh, Israeli society. Arrogance was not only the Israeli Defense Forces, arrogance was also a part of the Israeli society which thought no one could come to, uh, uh, to attack us through war, but the Egyptians and the Syrians did. And uh, some of the lessons which are very vivid today is not only pluralism, but cr critical and independent thinking. Israeli intelligence trains its junior officer to say and to write, writ large, whatever they want, whenever they want, to whomever they want. Now this may sound chaotic, chaotic, first of all it is. Secondly, it is something very embedded. Contrarian thinking and arguing, by the way, arguing also has roots in Jewish tradition. In Jewish, oh. yeah, I have like uh, 40 more papers here. <laughs> no, no, it's going to answer. Uh, I thought, you know, after speaking about biblical uh, and religious issues, like, um, so I spoke about critical and independent thinking and empowering the young officers. This is how I was trained, and this mentality is very vivid in Israeli intelligence, empowering the young and the junior officers. It is very regular, very usual in Israeli intelligence, in IDI, in Mossad, in Shabbat, to see a 21, 22-year-old junior officer disargue or argue and disagree with a two-star or three-star general or the director of an agency. It is very regular. This is the mentality, some of it is Israeli, the Jewish mentality, and some of it is really the lesson of the Yom Kippur War. Now, before we move on to really how does that uh, have to do with conservatism and, and innovation, uh, I have another biblical tale, although I'll try. Uh, everyone probably knows, I want to share uh, a biblical tale of the 12 spies sent by Moses to cure the land of Canaan. Everyone knows the story, and everyone knows this is the beginning of this country. But this story, and I'm not speaking about theological aspects here, because you know there's a disagreement. Who said the spies? Did Moses decide, or did God uh, ask Moses to send the, and the different versions in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and in the Quran? There are different versions for this story. But these were 12 spies, by the way, not intelligent professionals. They were politicians. Sent into the land of Canaan with very, very strict instructions to understand what's going inside the land before the uh, people of Israel enter the land, to understand what's going on and to bring physical evidence. In modern terms, we would say that, we're, that they were sent on a special operation for submission, to conduct collection, and to bring raw evidence. But what did they do? As you probably recall, 10 of the spies came back and said, we, the land of Israel, cannot conquer the land because in the land there are giants. And we are like grasshoppers to the giants. And two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said we can conquer the land. Now I'm not talking about the theological aspect, because the ten spies were punished, and Joshua and Caleb stayed alive. But look at what these people did. And I think this chaos is a bit also characteristic of Israel. They conducted a special operations mission, collection, analysis, what in modern times we call meta-assessment, they were just asked to bring raw evidence and say what's going on in the land of Knaan. But they conducted a net assessment, meaning they tried to understand can the people of Israel conquer the land, and they also provided policy recommendations. Ten said we should not enter the land, two said we should. And I'm not saying that in Israel everything is so chaotic, but this is a bit, uh, I think, resembles that in Israel the line between collection and analysis and policy recommendation and even that assessment are blurred. They exist, but they are blurred. So with this, I want to, to touch really a few aspects about how does Israeli intelligence balance these traditions, this history, uh, with innovation. First of all, from my research, the Yom Kippur War has many, many relevant lessons. But, and again, this is my personal view, 
from my personal research. It was a bit of a paralyzing trauma. Now we're not now in the field of psychology, but it was a bit of a paralyzing trauma. It took Israeli intelligence and Israeli defense intelligence. If you read what chiefs of the IDI have written in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, and they have written, it took Israeli intelligence almost three decades to understand that early warning for surprise military attacks by adversary conventional militaries, such as the Syrian and the Egyptian, is not a really relevant scenario. Almost three decades. This was a bit paralyzed. Now in Israel, and if you look about, uh, if you look at the heads of the research and assets division, they were my commanding officers. Usually I prepared for them, I briefed them before they were interviewed on public media. They always refer to the Yom Kippur War. Some of them say we have learned our lessons. Some of them have said the lessons are not relevant. But they all refer to the Yom Kippur War. So this is a very big uh, uh, tradition. And the Israelis, when they try, in Israeli intelligence, when it tries to conduct innovations and changes, it always trying to hang on to the tradition. Not to the tradition of the independence war in 1948, uh, where there was also the Israeli intelligence, but mainly to the tradition of the failure of uh, early warning in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, Israeli intelligence usually conducts innovation in what is the scholarly research is usually going as innovation through adaptation, meaning gradually, slowly, incrementally. There is rarely a grand vision of a dramatic transformation that could change everything. By the way, many new concepts of Israeli intelligence, as I believe this is not different from other intelligence communities, are tested on the tactical level. By the way, mainly for CT and counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations. Israel is now, and this has also been discussed in, in research, has now coined a new term called multi-domain intelligence, so bringing together collection analysis, something that is very untraditional. But that untraditional transformation is done in a very, very slow process, and very cautious. Um, inside the agencies, IDI, Mossad, and Shabbat, in 40 or 50 years, Almost everything has changed. Almost everything has changed. But the basic structure of the Israeli intelligence community, which I mentioned earlier, the EULA doesn't exist, the facto exists. The basic structure of this intelligence community, IDI, Mossad, and Shabak, has not changed. In decades, nothing. By the way, there were many attempts to create a director of national intelligence. All of these failed. Constantly. Major transformations inside the organization. No change, really a fixation in the overall uh, in the overall structure. And the last thing I want to say is a bit between traditionalism uh, or conservatism and innovation is the Israeli approach and the Israeli intelligence approach towards technology. First of all, if I would have to, to characterize subcultures, in Israeli intelligence, the people who do collection and special operations are usually very fond of technology. They are usually very innovative, very transformative, very quick, very agile. The analysts, such as myself, are a bit more traditional, are a bit more cautious. Itai Boon, I mentioned him several times, former head of the research and asset division, the research and asset division claims, that for many decades, the basic methodology of analysis has not changed. It's amazing. Connection methods have changed dramatically. And this is, again, very typical, I think, of this balance. So I do want to end with what, what challenges does this unique culture, which is really very ambivalent, very ambivalent. What challenges does this create today for Israeli intelligence? Uh, the implications, first of all, Israeli intelligence has been conducting and even a little bit writing about RIA, Revolution Intelligence Affairs. By the way, the American intelligence community is writing amazing things about revolutionary intelligence affairs, and I think also for that. So Israelis are conducting revolutionary intelligence affairs, but there are main islands in San Francisco community who say, don't revolutionize too much. We need our tradition. Again, mainly in terms of analysis. Israeli intelligence wants to put resources to long-term uh, threats, diverse threats, naturally mainly from Iran. Nuclear proliferation, cyber whatever. But, as we might have seen earlier. The daily challenges of Israeli intelligence are the Palestinians. And it's a tension that Israeli intelligence tries to balance. 
Israeli intelligence is trying to support what Israel has been conducting the last decade throughout the campaign between the wars. It's an ongoing, offensive, proactive, preventive, again, IVE, too many IVE words, but a campaign to counter adversaries' uh, force buildup and entrenchment uh, efforts in the region. But Israeli intelligence knows that it needs to support this campaign, but it needs to prepare intelligence for grand campaigns of a hybrid conflict, such as with Jibala and with Hamas. With Hamas, for example, Israel fought in 2020, in 2014, in 2012, in 2009. That's a lot of hybrid conflicts. Two last issues. Uh, Israeli intelligence, I believe, is other intelligence communities getting drawn and inclined towards tactical intelligence. Tactical intelligence is very tangible. By the way, on a professional level, it's very you know, fun to do. But there is a great need, I believe, especially in this age of, of the data, uh, to have better strategic intelligence, but it depends in a very fast pace. And now, really, two last aspects. Um, Israel, Israeli intelligence still thinks and speaks and does many things regarding early warning. But it is on a phase of transforming because early warning has to be conducted not for traditional military conflicts. By the way, if you know, Israeli national security doctrine has some several pillars. One of them is battlefield decision. Battlefield decision is for conventional military conflicts. We live in a different era. Look at what's happening in the US with the great power. And the last issue is really trying to uh, uh, balance, this goes back to between conservatism and innovation, trying to balance between quantitative methods using AI and machine learning, machine learning and algorithms. By the way, the personnel needed for these missions are people with technology, less with knowledge about the Persian culture or about the Palestinian or the Arab language. How to balance this between qualitative, maybe even hermeneutical, uh, you know, inter interpreted uh, storytelling analysis. Uh, so with that, I think uh, I would end. I hope this was quite a, a short, I hope it was even a bit interesting introduction to Israel intelligence. Uh, thank you very much, and I very much look forward to our discussion. Where's the accountability? Where's the oversight? 
I thought we would start with the easy question. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's a hard question because, and again, this is just my personal opinion. Civilian structured oversight in Israel over the intelligence community, intelligence agencies, I would say, is rather weak and unstructured. Uh, the IDI, for example, simply is a military organization, is subordinate to the law. There is an idea of law in Israel. Shabbat is subordinate to law. There is a, a law in Israel. And constituted by the parliament, the Knesset. Mossad, there is no law in Israeli, there is no Israeli constitution, but there is no law overseeing uh, Mossad activities. I think that in terms of civilian constitutional oversight, it is rather weak. It is rather, and again, I believe this is very Israeli, it is more conducted between the prime minister and the heads of services. Then, for example, I always admire you when I see the U.S. heads of services testify for the Senate. Uh, heads of Israeli agencies do not testify before the parliament or before the uh, uh, foreign, foreign relations committee of the parliament. They sometimes appear before a very secret, uh, specific uh, committee. So I think it is less conducted in a structured manner Public debate in Israel, again, this is my personal opinion, usually admires. There's an admiration of Israeli intelligence. Uh, there are issues of ethical of ethics, uh, but I would say in that sense, very different from, from, from the United States and even from Britain. Well, oversight is not really defined by structured law and directives. It is more uh, informal um, and more on the basis of personal personal relations, uh, mainly with the prime minister. Again, the prime minister, he is the one who, he or she, is the one in charge of the Mossad and Shabbat and indirectly of the IDI. So I think it's, it's a very interesting question because naturally Israel is a very, very vibrant democracy. But now I'm speaking as an Israeli civilian. Critical articles in Israeli media or journalism about Israeli intelligence, rather rare. <laughs> Rather irregular, critical articles. By the way, there are many critical articles against the IDF as a whole. Not just in terms of ethics, but in terms of management, in terms of resources, in terms of how do we, we Israeli taxpayers, how is the government using our taxes? I believe Israeli intelligence, Mossad, which is a myth, not only in the world, but also in Israel, Shabak, which is a myth, and also Israeli defense intelligence, is not really being criticized, it's still considered I'm a beacon on the hill, an island of excellence. Uh, so this is my my feeling, and it's a hard question. Looking looking forward on that same issue, I mean, you described the informal mechanisms and the, the status, the stature that these institutions hold in Israeli society, which is understandable and, and, and significant. I'd ask you just a forecast, though, looking forward. There have been abuses. Yes. There have been crimes committed. Directors and senior officers have been forced to resign yes. before and commit to, submit to criminal uh, investigation and prosecution. Do you think, going forward, Israel is going to move towards the U.S. model and acquire more of this highly intrusive, periodic, asking questions, legislative oversight, and, and scrutiny, the kind that we live with every day? Yes. Uh, since it's being recorded, and you're asking me for a forecast, my personal, you know, intelligence, we do not do forecasts. Right, I believe it was Professor Joseph Nye who said, I, 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 I learned that with intelligence does not foresee or forecast the future, it's supposed to help decision makers think about the future. Sounds good. I believe in that argument. Anyway, my personal opinion is no. I think Israel would not go in that institutionalized, bureaucratic, structured process and maintain that informal. Now, you know, in 1984, there was an, an incident, you probably referred to that, of Shabak, uh, and the uh, heads of Shabak were prosecuted because uh, two terrorists were actually killed uh, instead of being arrested. And that was a dramatic, uh, 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 not only a failure, it was a real ethical trauma. But I believe that the, the, the 
excuse me, the dominant, the in, informality is so dominant that I don't see again. I, I saw a few days ago, I saw General Kelly and General McKenzie testify. I don't think that for seeing future, Israeli generals standing and testifying under oath in front of a large audience and on the record in public. I don't see that in a, in a few years, in, in the far future maybe, but this is, this is my very, very personal, subjective, and humble answer. Okay, well thanks for breaking your rule on forecasting. <laughs> so, <laughs> talk to me about change. Uh, our intelligence community and your intelligence community, uh, one of the things we've learned over and over is that real fundamental, serious, deep-seated change in U.S. intelligence can really only follow a catastrophic outcome, a disaster, a major failure that attracts the public's interest. So we look at Pearl Harbor, we look at the Bay of Kings, we look at the 9 11 attacks, and we look at the flawed analysis in 2002 of the rocks, yes. weapons of massacre. These were seminal events for us, and each caused significant change. In fact, we have a director of national intelligence, we have a new structure, all because this was the corrective that was prescribed by people looking into the 9 11 attacks. So, so change comes rarely and slowly and in our system only after significant disaster. Now, Israel has had some mishaps. You talked about Yom Kippur, right? October 1973. You mentioned it from several perspectives, but the one I'm interested in exploring is, is that key relationship between the intelligence professionals and the policy makers. Because as my friend Professor Pope uh, often described, there are many points of failure in the intelligence process. You can fail to collect the information you need, you can fail to evaluate it, and integrate it, and convey it properly, but it's also a failure if the policymaker isn't listening yes. and doesn't act on what they're being told for lack of confidence or for distraction or for a concept. I use that term deliberately. Yes, 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 yes. And so, tell me what's changed since 1973 in the relationship between the providers of intelligence and the decision makers. Because that, it seems to me, was the significant flaw yes. in 73. Your analysis is more important. No, no. Um, I'll answer you know, in two parts, not in three. First of all, I think, uh, you know, the Israeli major traumas are really the young people law and the 2006 uh, Second Avenue War. But, but Israel also failed to anticipate the first Palestinian Intifada in 1987, a totally intelligence failure of analysis. By the way, it also failed, this was already published, uh, almost failed to anticipate Hamas taking over the Gaza, 2005, 2006. But I think in Israeli intelligence, and my personal perspective, and as you've seen, I'm biased towards cultural explanations, at least I'm aware that I'm biased. In Israeli culture and in Israeli national intelligence culture, transformation is constant. Israeli intelligence does not need a colossal failure to transform. Uh, I'm taking, for example, Lieutenant General Aviv Kohadi, the current chief of general staff of the IDF who was the chief of the IDI between 2010, I think, to 2015. He even published an amazing article about the transformation he conducted in the IDI in those years. And he mentioned the roots for that transformation. It wasn't a colossal failure. It was his understanding that the IDI was not relevant enough for the information age, for operations, for cyber, for the new ways to conduct analysis. So my answer is that Israelis, writ large, and I believe also Israeli intelligence, does not need a policy uh, failure to transform. Israeli intelligence always tries to transform. It's like a constant feel of uh, inconvenience. I can tell you, again, it's beginning to sound like uh, you know, psychology uh, lecture, and I'm not a psychology expert, but I grew up constantly to feel inconvenient. Constantly to feel that what I'm doing is not really relevant, or is not relevant enough, or is not sufficient. This is the mindset they, you know, they educate. The second issue regarding young people who are, which really, besides the analytical failure, you can think about many other issues. And again, the more I read about it, the simple thing that they were, you know, arrogant or dogmatic, I think it's a wrong explanation, 
They were amazing intelligence officers. They made mistakes. But they were amazing intelligence officers. I think one of the lessons that has been learned, you can take, for example, after the 2006 war with Hezbollah, there was a national inquiry committee in Israel called the Vinograd Committee. Vinograd, he was a, a, you know, a judge at the Supreme Court, chief justice. Chief justice. By the way, in Israel, national inquiry committees are very rare. In that committee, they blame intelligence, not just for not understanding Hezbollah well enough, but for not influencing the decision makers to understand Hezbollah. And I think one of the issues that has changed, uh, you can see, for example, Eli Zerira, the director of military intelligence in the Young People World, who has written memoirs and published uh, uh, articles and reports. Uh, the cynicals, you know, tend to, to think that he's just trying to defend himself. I do not think so. He's an amazing individual. You can see how he described how he acted in 1973. He was the intelligence officer, but they were the decision makers. Moshe Dayan, the Minister of Defense, and Goda Mayer, the Prime Minister. My perspective is that nowadays, intelligence understands. If you give a great analytical product, but you don't proactively try to influence orally, not just in written words. By the way, I was trained on written words, and the oral was an anecdote. I think now it's a little bit different. Israeli intelligence officers now are trained. If you don't influence through oral, uh, uh, oral events, you're not doing your job. And I was trained to think that intelligence, and I know this sounds a little bit not objective, not scientific, that intelligence success, by the way, this is a topic for PhD, what is success in intelligence? That intelligence success is measured through how do you influence the decision maker on the tactical, operational, and strategic level. When I was an intelligence officer of a brigade, I spent from 24 hours of the day, I, of the, I spent 23 hours, one hour I had sleep, and I spent 23 hours with my brigade commander. I had to be near him all the time, by the way, not to discuss intelligence and operations, but to discuss everything. I think that has changed. This also had to be false. And by itself, intelligence can be manipulated. But I think that has dramatically changed. And I think really what has changed, although, although there were failures, is really the mindset of critical thinking. When I was the head of the Red Team, Red Team Look for intelligent professionals, it's almost impossible. You, you come in the morning and you can write whatever you want to whomever you want all the time. And uh, I participate without going into too many details. And I'm not unique in that sense. I'm just, you know, reflecting the culture. I had many, many encounters with three star generals and with the Minister of Defense and even with the Prime Minister telling them in four eyes or in six eyes that they were wrong. And I'm not unique in that sense. This is an Israeli mentality I believe that has changed. In 1973, everything was rather strict. The IDI had one opinion and one assessment and one stand, that of the chief. Now, uh, for example, the IDI, I told you, has a research and asset division. The head of the research and asset division, or one star general, is subordinate to the chief of the IDI. But the chief of the IDI cannot tell the research analysis division head what to think, or what to write, or what to assess, and not who to write. Uh, very, very dominant issue, I think, of dominant and critical thing. Thanks for that. Did, did Captain Shapira or Major Shapira ever write an intelligence assessment and send it directly to the chief of the service or the CHAD? Uh, Lieutenant Shapira did. <laughs> I just soon became Captain Shapira. Yes. No, but I have to say, I don't know if it's recorded, but I'll tell you a secret. Those two uh, 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 papers I wrote were forecasts of the future, and they were both wrong. <laughs> but I got called to the two-star general's office. Three people, the head of the research and analysis division, myself, and the chief of the IDI, and he told me, now you're, you're going to explain to me what you've written. And I remember this was 1996 or 7. And I took out the pages. He told me, look, no pages. Tell me what you think. 
And I told him, and he said, you didn't do this. And lucky for us, he wasn't convinced because I was wrong. Yeah. But yes, I, I wrote papers. And as a colonel, I remember, still vivid for me, telling the Minister of Defense, he's making a strategic mistake. By the way, this was a policy issue, not an intelligence. I don't know who was right. It's a policy issue you can't really decide. But again, I'm not unique and not special in that sense. This is, I believe, how we were trained. And this is an area of obvious contrast between our system, where we separate zealously the policy-making process from the intelligence process. Which leads me to the question you touched on a little bit, but every intelligence professional has to be asked their opinion on proximity versus distance, right? And maybe it's changed over time, but in the United States, we originally believed that Sherman Kent, again, would subscribe to this, was that you needed to keep your intelligence analysts to ensure their objectivity isolated and separated from the people who collect the information and also from the people, their customers, who are, who are going to use it because they could be too easily biased and swayed and shade their analysis to reflect the views of their friend, the policymaker, or their friend, the collection officer. Um, we've gone 180 degrees from that now, and we generally accept that having your intelligence officers close to your policymakers is the right answer. So they're attuned to their issues, their questions, their concerns, know what kind of support they're going to require, so we've got 180 on this, and we're all about proximity now. Intelligence close to policy. Where are you guys? Uh, or where should you be? I think, again, my personal opinion, we should be more in the area of proximity. By the way, you mentioned objectivity. Uh, there's a great American scholar of intelligence, Stephen Murray, um, who I've been reading many of his articles, and he's just recently, about a year ago, written an article about the objectivity in the American intelligence community. In my 26 years, I've never heard the word objectivity. Neutrality, definitely. Unbiased, definitely, but not objectivity. Uh, by the way, I've almost never used scientific methods. The Israeli approach, I think I told you, is a bit more, this on the analytical side, not on the collection special operation, is a bit more artistic. I think we should be much uh, closer to the proximity than to the distance. And first of all, again, my personal opinion, objectivity regarding thinking about the future is not relevant because the future is not objective uh, truth, you know, a bit of, of philosophy. But I think it's better to manage the risks embedded in proximity than to be irrelevant in the far side of distant. There are, I can say that there is an IDI view. I can tell you from some of the people I've interviewed for my research, some of the people, uh, very senior and amazing professionals, one star general, two star generals, I've interviewed said, we've gone too far in proximity. We're biased. It's a sin. We should maintain distance. By the way, I always, you know, there's, I can remember some of them are still my friend, I hope. Had the research and asset division. One is very conservative, one is very innovative. One is rather about distance and objectivity or neutrality. One is all about influence. You can't influence from the outside. This is my, my personal opinion. Good. I think I, I think I agree with you. Okay, this is a warning order. This is my last question, and then we'll open it up to you guys. Uh, gray zone. Uh, so you mentioned it, sort of new kinds of war, new definitions of war, hybrid warfare. Um, your former boss, our friend, uh, General Amashad, when he was here, talked to us about the campaign between the wars, the constancy, right? The, the variety of attacks. Um, you're engaged in, for all intents and purposes, you, Israel, uh, a gray zone conflict a hybrid war with Iran. It yes. unfolds literally daily, weekly, across across the region. What are the implications of that for intelligence and intelligence analysis? There's no break. There's no peace. There's no time when you can regroup, learn lessons from the last engagement, prepare and get better. The war is constant. That's from the future. Will there be an easy question? <laughs> um, 
I think there are dramatic implications. Again, I apologize a little bit psychology, but think about what an intelligence analyst or a senior analyst such as I was has to do when you provide intelligence for this campaign between the wars. You have to, as an intelligence analyst, recognize the opportunities when it is relevant to conduct an airstrike with low probability for retaliation. At the same time, since I told you the IDI is richer than asset division, does targeting tactical intelligence. At the same time, you have to provide the specific targets. But at the same time, you are the one, and I was in that job a few times, you are the one who has to tell the chief of the IDI or the chief of staff, this is not working. This is total schizophrenia. Uh, I think the implications are, are in two or three aspects. First of all, I remember one of the generals told us, intelligence is constantly in warfare. The word, uh, again, I don't want to sound too militaristic, okay, but intelligence is in constant warfare, constant 24-7. If you think about this metaphorically, intelligence in this gray zone or competition is constantly engaging the enemy. Constantly, by the way, if you're conducting cyber operations, and some intelligence communities in the world are conducting cyber operations, you're practically constantly engaging your adversary. You're not fighting it, but you're engaging it. So I think the issue of pace is one aspect. I can tell you from my personal experience, it is hard to keep up with that pace and to be such single friend. Again, you have to recognize the opportunity, but at the same time tell your general, this is not the right thing to do. I will supply the target for this strike, but this airstrike is the wrong thing to do. And the third, uh, the third issue, I think, a major implication, I think there's a great field for gray zone warfare and for competition. I call it, I call it, I think about it, in terms of intelligence for deterrence. This is not deterrence by punishment or deterrence by denial of relevant for military conflict. The whole issue of gray zone warfare is to come up with a brilliant concept how do you deter the enemy when you conduct a strike, kinetic or not kinetic? Deter the adversary from retaliating, but also deter the adversary from conducting its action which you are countering. For example, the Israeli campaign between the wars against Iranian entrenchment in the Middle East should not only deter the Syrians or the Iranians to retaliate, it should deter the Syrians and the Iranians from, from designing, from entrenching themselves. I can tell you from my personal perspectives, this is a blue ocean. Intelligence for deterrence on all aspects in gray zone warfare is really a blue ocean. It's something that has to be dealt with theoretically, practically. I haven't given enough thought to this when I was in service. I haven't given enough thought to this now that I'm conducting the research. And again, it's a mindset of warfare. And you know, uh, some people, you know, some analysts, Israeli analysts, work or serve, in Israel we say we serve, we do not work, they serve in the Kiryah. The Kiryah is a military base in the middle of Tel Aviv. So you might say, yeah, you know, they're in the middle of Tel Aviv, with the shopping malls and everything. They're in constant warfare, 24-7. Okay, through computers, and through screens. So this is my response, and I think this, is, this will become very, very dominant. Humbly, I would say, in this much broader global American concept of gray ball competition, this is the issue. Deterring Russia, deterring China, and conducting operations about preventing escalation. Let's see, you, Chad. Well, thanks for sharing that. Those sound like good topics for theses, uh, if anybody's in the market for them. Um, Kim's in the back of the room. Who would like to ask a question? Sir. Sir, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. that's right. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Max Ferguson. I'm a PhD student here at the LPJ School. I'm also a career Army officer in the U.S. Army. My question is about how the IDI approaches this. Because in the U.S., I sense a tension between the intelligence community and the national security practitioners, the consumers of intelligence, on this idea of classification and compartmentalization of information to where there's a desire on one side to protect the sources and methods of how we attain that information, but at the same time, there's also this inclination to over-classify information 
for a multitude of reasons, whether it's because we're being overprotected or we're just accustomed to classifying something as secret, top secret, or in a compartmentalized zone, which limits the access to that information to disseminate it for decision makers and for, and for people in the community to be aware, and understand, and facilitate decisions. How does the IBI balance this need to both protect sources and methods, but also make information available for the consumers to therefore make decisions? Thank you. Great question. Uh, again, I, I apologize for not you know, discussing you know, specific details. But I would say that in the IDI, because on these issues on Mossad and Shabak, I really don't know. But on the IDI perspective, more inclined towards access from the decision maker than towards over classification. Uh, I've participated in numerous discussions about the dangers of creating access for decision makers. And I can tell you again, without going into too many details, the general, and you won't find a, a doctrine about this, but the general idea is to give access to decision makers, or for decision makers, to raw intelligence with many, many, I would say, defensive mechanisms. Uh, because I believe there is a sense, by the way, you might say that also goes back to the Young People War. Because in the Young People War, there was some raw information that allegedly the chief of the IDI did not report to the decision makers. And they, as you all know, they received raw information from the Mossad. The director of the Mossad's visa here met Israel's top uh, spy, Ashraf Hawan, which said there was going to be a war, but the assessment was different. And I think the inclination is more towards access. Uh, with all the pitfalls and the risks, uh, and I think it's different than the US system. Could, could I just yes, follow sure. on with that? Is, is that because I would acknowledge that Israel, I think, does a better job of keeping its secrets secret than we do in our system? We have a lot more players. We have a lot more meetings. We have a lot more uh, aggressive journalists. We don't have a military censor. Israel does. The Israeli military censorship is practically the national censor. Right. The military censor is, he or she, is the national censor. Israel. Speaking of difficult jobs, the colonel who has that job, uh, I wouldn't want to trade. But do you think that's part of it? You have confidence at the end of the day that if you share this with a circle of policymakers, it's going to stay secret that day. I think usually this is the case. Yeah. Again, comparing, it's, it's so difficult, you know, Israeli intelligence communities, three and a half organizations. You can't, you know, compare to the 17 or 18 organizations and the global outreach of the U.S. with Israeli, you know, focus on the Middle East. I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure Israel is very good at keeping secrets, but there is, again, I believe informality has a sense. There is some sort of sense of responsibility and trust between intelligence and decision making, by the way, mostly they know each other and they involve serve together in the military. Well, that, that's another fact that we talked about last night. It's right. Many of the political leaders in Israel are former intelligence officers. They're quite familiar with the profession and the product. So that, on one hand, makes them trustworthy. On the other hand, makes them pretty difficult uh, to deal with because they think they know the right answer. That's different. Sir, I'm sorry. My name is Peter Cleve. I used to be a professor here at the Center. And then later, I attended the foundation in the United Arab Emirates, uh, created by Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the board member, the uh, head of the board of Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed. Mm. And you always sensed in the Emirates in those days a uh, very uh, tempered attitude toward the toward history. Uh, we know that the intelligence service of Israel cooperated with the intelligence services of the United Arab Emirates. Then there was the big bombshell, the recognition of Israel by Bahrain and by the United Arab Emirates. My question relating to culture is, does the intelligence community of Israel sort of sense that it has a uh, diplomatic or foreign affairs role, and to what extent did this 
of relationship smoothed the way for the ultimate recognition of Israel by the United Arab Emirates? Um, first of all, I, I hope you excuse me enough for not discussing those specific issues of intelligence cooperation, but you mentioned a such an important topic of intelligence, Israel intelligence role in foreign policy and diplomacy. Uh, if you just you know look at the media and the newspapers, you see the high profile of the Mossad. In these Abraham Accords with the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco, you saw the director of the Mossad, Yossi Khan, on the White House lawn. Mossad, I told you earlier, a covert secret organization and the Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations. I think, and this goes a little bit to what I sometimes I think about Israeli strategic culture. In Israeli strategic culture, usually many scholars say that there's a trend of security, securityization, meaning that security organizations do a lot more than security. For example, foreign policy or diplomacy. So I, I cannot really, you know, uh, 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 relate to issues of intelligence cooperation. But I can say that in Israel, I think Mossad is the best example. Uh, and Mossad, in its formal and public roles, it's clandestine diplomacy. By the way, it might sound like a contradiction. I think it is not. In the Middle East, clandestine diplomacy, uh, probably the best. I think they will continue to play a role because I think intelligence organizations and specifically the Mossad in that sense is, is really unique because they have an understanding of the environment, they have an expertise in clandestine operations and diplomacy, and they have an understanding of the Israeli decision maker. Uh, so that is my answer. I hope it answers, although I know it doesn't completely answer uh, everything, but I think if these Abraham Accords or other Accords will develop, I think the Israeli intelligence community will play even a larger role. By the way, if you look at historical research, there historical research, some of the peace processes Israeli uh, decision makers initiated were without intelligence, such as the peace agreement with the PLO in 1993. The Israeli intelligence community was not consulted. When El Barak, as prime minister, decided to withdraw Israeli forces from Lebanon in 2000, this is all being published. The intelligence community was not consulted. Um, the peace with Egypt in 1979. One of the, at least as an Israeli civilian, I can say, one of the most dramatic events you know, in the Middle East, peace between Israel and Egypt. The intelligence community was not a part of it. I think nowadays it's a bit different. I must say that during this discussion reminds me of uh, in the early days of the uh, pandemic. We learned that, or at least it was reported, that Israel's security services have gone out to purchase vaccines yes. that were available. And for an American intelligence officer, that that just sends shutters down your back. There, there is no conceivable way in our form of government, the way we order our things, that we would have sent an intelligence agency out to purchase vaccines in a foreign country. But yet it would seem to me accepted as normal that the Mossad would take this off. And if I can, uh, I, I want to leave time for a question, but this is an, an interesting topic. I even wrote an article about that. It's not only that Mossad went out to purchase. Israeli military intelligence, the IDI, you can go to the Israeli Ministry of Health website. It's only in Hebrew, actually. But Google Translate does a rather good job. Israeli uh, IDI formed a national information center for analyzing COVID trends. Look, this is probably wouldn't happen in the US. Yeah. Now, of course, they're not collecting information about Israeli civilians, whatsoever. None, nothing. But IDI has good analysts who know to conduct big data exploitation and to use a bit of artificial intelligence and even a bit of machine learning. And this is very Israeli, and there were debates in Israel, is that ethical? By the way, in Israel, now when I'm going back to Israel, both of my daughters, I have to make sure they're you know, tested once a day, once a week for COVID. Some of the uh, test centers for COVID are being, run, are being run by the IDF, logistically. 
we're not there yet, and I don't think we can get there. <laughs> and anyway, and thanks for running the gauntlet. But this man has been swiped and scrubbed so many times between Israel and the United States that we trust him completely. Open the corner, sir. Yes, uh, you, you wait, let, wait for the mic, sir. So I'm going to get up here. And uh, when I come in front of the speakers, so they can see that, who was? Those are the camera. I follow you. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the uh, startup nation, people going from the intelligence community to military intelligence to, to careers. And um, you didn't mention the cyber director, but I, a couple of years ago I heard Luna, Luna, you know, Luna speak, and you, you talked about how within the cyber director, they, they depend on civilians coming in working for less money for a while than going back and assaulting the service. So there are two questions. One, in terms of young Israelis as they're being drafted and it's very competitive to get into uh, military intelligence, is this done with an eye towards careers and, and you know and cashing in as opposed to strict national service? And then the second thing is, and Steve was clear, we're not going to talk policy or whatever, but Black Cube and NSO Group. Uh, the feeling is certainly here that these are well integrated, uh, a lot of connections to uh, the various intelligence agencies. So culturally, is this part? Is the, is the intelligence, the various intelligence communities uh, share a culture with the NSO Group, or is this antithetical to the operations? Uh, Thanks. Thanks for that. I call this, I call this the startup nation question. Ah, the startup nation. No, it, it's a great question. Uh, the second part is easy for me to answer. I really have no idea about these issues, and uh, I, I don't believe it, it's proper for me to, to relate to that. The first part is so important. There's a great public debate in Israel whether it is ethical that young soldiers at the age of 18 get recruited to the IDR at Unit 8200, and after four or five years, they are the ones, and most of the CEOs of the cyber and AI companies were born and raised, not born, but raised, in Unit 8200. Uh, May I ask you to yes. explain to everybody the Unit 8200, just what they do? This is the, the uh, SIGINT unit, Signal Intelligence Unit, and also uh, conducts uh, cyber uh, issues. Again, as in Israel, this is a military unit with defense and national responsibilities. Uh, considered one of the best secret agencies in the world. I have not served in that unit. I'm just an analyst. Uh, but there's a great public debate in Israel about that. Uh, based on my personal experience in 26 years, which in all of these 26 years, I've served alongside people from 8200. The young people who go to 8200, maybe they have in the back of their minds, because they read papers, uh, that it is a potential for a career. But they go to that unit for patriotism. And by the way, it's really, it's, uh, you know, we can't discuss details, but when you visit that unit, you see what these you know, kids, 18, 19, 20 years old are doing, you just can't believe, it's like science fiction. These are not 30, 35 years old graduates with professional or academic background. These are 20 year olds using mainly TikTok and Instagram <laughs> and doing it's science fiction. Uh, I think it's mainly patriotism, but there is a public debate in Israel about that, even now, in Israeli journalism. There are even politicians in Israel, personally I think they're wrong, but there are even politicians in Israel saying that the screening for Unit 8200 is not conducted in a moral sense that not anyone can get inside. By the way, I tried as an 18-year-old soldier. I went through the test and failed. I failed the test. By the way, luckily for me and luckily for them. For 8200, I wouldn't be successful as a second uh, operator or second analyst. But uh, there is even a debate in Israel, is the screening conducted in a moral way? Uh, I think it's an issue that we'll, we will continue to, to, to discuss, but basically I think they, the people who recruit for patriotism 
and from moral and ethical uh, standards. Uh, although they know that this is a good way to start a business circle. Uh, you can see here, even in the US, uh, some cyber companies, which are headed by former commanders of the uh, United 200. So this is my question. I know it's partial. That's terrific. We have time for maybe one or two, two more. Three, if we're concise with that. Really good. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Caroline Corbett. Um, I'm a second year student at LBJ in international global policy. Um, I have a question about the domestic intel agency that you mentioned. Um, so given the rise of domestic extremism here in the US, there's been a lot of discussion on what the role of the intelligence community should be in response to this issue. It's kind of, oh sorry, domestic extremism. Domestic extremism, okay. Right. Um, and of course in the US it's a bit hard to imagine uh, this agency being created given you know, uh, thoughts of Stasi and other similar concerns, as well as, you know, NSA, you know, stores of NSA spying, et cetera. Um, but I think it's an important question to discuss what can the role of the IC be here in response to this issue. I'm wondering if you could kind of give a little further background on kind of if there's any tension um, is in Israeli society, given that there's a domestic, you know, uh, agency, uh, and kind of the beginnings of it, how it's formed in response to an event, or kind of there's a natural rollout of, a, of an agency uh, that was needed and identified by the, you know, some society or government or whatever maybe. Yes, that's a great question. First of all, formally, the agency is in, uh, in charge of these. Uh, but the second major failure of Shabbat, was a failure to anticipate and to foil the assassination of Prime Minister Ali, the 4th of November, 1995. Every Israeli remembers that day. National disaster. Whether you're left or right, does not. National disaster. Why am I mentioning this? Because uh, Shabak is really entitled of counter-espionage, counter-insurgency, but also counter-extremism. And uh, it's rather accepted in Israel, but there are two populations which are very much on the spot, and they have even public clashes with Shabbat. First of all, naturally, the Arab population, the Arab population, uh, which we've had some incidents of Arab civilians, as you all know, about 18, 90% of the Israeli population is Arab civilians. There were very rare, very, very rare, but there were cases of Arab, Arab Israeli citizens conducting terrorist attacks. And there's always the question of are they being rightly treated? The other group is the Jewish right, extreme right. By the way, this is the group from which came Igal Amir, who was the murderer of the Prime Minister. And this is being discussed publicly in Israel. Uh, how can Shabbat, on the one hand, conduct counter-terrorist operations against Palestinian terrorists, you know, to this day, but on the other hand, conduct surveillance against Israeli civilians. Now, again, I'm a military, I'm a retired military officer. I've never conducted anything regarding civilians. Even when I hear this issue, I have no opportunities. But uh, Shabak is really a, a very, it's very complicated uh, uh, role. And I think it's, by the way, Shabak is also in charge of counter espionage. Nations, superpowers, conduct espionage in Israel. It's not a secret. And I think that role would be even more complicated because the issues of privacy and civil rights might not be publicly debated in Israel as in the US, but they are publicly debated. By the way, during the COVID test, there were times where you as a civilian received an, an SMS, you know, a notification, that you were near a civilian who was infected, meaning that someone was tracking our phones. Now it's not a secret. It was publicly debated in Israel, it stopped, but it's a very, very complicated issue. I do not envy a Shabak which have to counter terrorism, counter espionage, counter insurgency, but it's, it's, it's really publicly debated in Israel, a very complicated issue. I think I'm going to have to draw a line in right there. I appreciate everybody's forbearance. We're grateful for Colonel Shapiro's travel to the States and his insights. This afternoon. We'll be around here for a couple of minutes if you have some questions for on that. Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate it.